Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Feld, and I'm president of the Periodic Paralysis Association. And tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, love, lust, and trust. And I know that really gets your heart beating. Um, <laughs> I'm here with my husband, Ed, tonight. And we also have Monica and Dan Kramer with us tonight. And in the center of your screen, you will see Danielle Werner, and she is our marketing manager, and she's going to play MC tonight because we couldn't figure out how to keep jumping back before between all of us. <laughs> so I am going to let Danielle uh, take it from here. And Danielle, you want to just go over the rules for tonight a little bit? Sure, sure. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm super excited to be here. I know this this is a going to be a, a really fun webinar and a lot of interesting conversations I hope we have tonight. So I'm looking forward to it. A couple of things before we really dive in. Um, we have some questions that we've already um, gathered from previous people that we're going to be asking our couples tonight. Um, but before we dive into those questions, I just want to remind everyone that this is technically an 18 and over event. Um, we are discussing some um, risque topics, if you will, but that conversation is meant to be open and casual. And we want everyone to feel like this is a safe space to talk about love, lust, and trust. That's why we're all here. Um, so if you have questions, we'd love for you to hold them till the end, write them down. We don't want you to forget them. But at the end, we're going to be opening this up to some discussion for um, any questions that our listeners have. So we want you to know we're, we're ready for those. We want to take them on. Though this isn't really about the medical side of periodic paralysis, right? This isn't, this has much more to do with how we live our daily lives and how we interact with the people that we love. So if you do have any medical questions or, or that comes up and you think of any while you're listening in, please make sure that you email those to us. And you can email Linda at lynda.feld at periodic paralysis. Uh, we're going to do our best to reach as many questions as we can tonight, of course, trying to keep them at that level that is appropriate for uh, this live event. Um, and um, I, I'm here listening in and, and, and sharing what we're going to be getting into tonight. But of course, the story is really about these two lovely couples that we have. So before we dive into asking them questions, I want to just uh, share a little bit of uh, a fun little article that uh, Linda found a while back and we wanted to save it because we knew this was the perfect type of event to share this story with everyone. So um, the, the story comes from an article titled, What is Love? And the great thing about this article is that it wasn't just asked to the general public. It wasn't a question that, you know, an average person was asked. It was specifically asked to children. This group of professionals posed this question to a group of four to eight year olds. What does love mean to you? And the answers were so amazing and profound and deeper than probably a lot of the things we might come up with in this moment that we just wanted to share a little bit of these quotes from these kids at the beginning of this webinar to kind of get, get our juices flowing, get our ideas rolling and and really get down to like what is what matters here and, and when it comes to love, lust, and trust. So here are some of the answers the kids said. Um, and if you're listening in or if you know where the chat box is, feel free to chime in. If you can think of any that you want to remember, I already know a couple of these I'm going to be quoting later for sure. Um, so we love feedback. If you're listening in and you hear something you love, share it with us. Tell us that you're enjoying this, okay? So Quote one comes from Rebecca at the age of eight. She said, when my grandmother got arthritis and she couldn't bend over to paint her toenails anymore, my grandfather does it for her now, even when he has arthritis too. That's love. Billy at age four says, when someone loves you, they just say your name differently. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. I mean, come on. How about this one from Terry? four years old. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. I mean, real. 
Danny, age eight, says, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy, but she takes a sip before giving it to him just to make sure it tastes okay. That's love. I got that one already. I'm glad I have a guy who does that for me. Um, Bobby, age seven, says, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and just listen. Like, who would have thought that a seven-year-old would come up with saying that, right? Nika at age seven, age six says, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. So I really hope that one sticks with people. I'd like to talk about that a little bit tonight because it's true. If there is, if there is negativity, right? Like that's the first place you need to start if you want to create some sort of love. Um, the comment the professionals said was, we need a few more million people like Nika on this planet. Another one, Elaine at age five says, love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you've left him alone all day. Love is when somebody loves you when your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. <laughs> There's a visual. You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you really mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. And that comes from Jessica at the age of eight. And I'll read this last one because they literally won a contest. This four-year-old child, it says, um, he, he saw that his next door neighbor who was an elderly gentleman had recently lost his wife. And upon seeing the man cry, the little boy went into the old gentleman's yard, climbed onto his lap in his porch and just sat there. So when his mother asked him, why, why did you go over to the neighbor? The little boy said, I didn't have anything to do. I just helped him cry. So let's just take a few seconds before we get started and really diving into what it means to love someone, to trust someone, to have lust for someone. And think about the fact that these are like, little children who know nothing compared to what we know in the real world and yet they're able to distill down what love is down to these simple sayings i just i love it i think it's beautiful and i want to remind everyone as we get started that this conversation really is about um connection right it's about finding ways to say things like these kids said just naturally right it's hard for us as we become adults to learn to trust and actually find love in our hearts so um tonight's conversation as much as it is love lust and trust there are so many underlying things that come out of those three elements and i i think they're the perfect words that are the foundation to any great relationship right so let's let's dive into some of these words and ask um, well, first, before I ask questions, I feel like I should give a, a little bit more of an intro to the great couples that we have here tonight. I'm sure those of you who are listening in know Linda Feld well. She's the one you normally see here on the webinars. She's joined with her husband, Ed. Ed, wave. Let everyone know what husband you are. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Linda and Ed, how long have you guys been married? Uh, we've been married for 46 years. How long have you known each other or been together? 51 years. <laughs> wow, wow, that's amazing. And, and, and we also have Dan and Monica Kramer, who I can say personally are dear friends of mine, and I just got to witness their beautiful wedding ceremony. So I'm excited to hear more from them and their love relationship. So tell us, how long have you two been together? and um, how long has the marriage been? Is it a year? Has it been a year? It's, it's almost been as long as, uh, as Ed and Linda's. It's, it's been just over a year. <laughs> <laughs> but we've known each other for seven years. Seven years this month. What, wow, very cool, very cool. So this, you know, I, I, I want everyone who's listening in to feel like wherever you're coming from in your life, I know personally meeting other people who have created a successful relationship or a long-term relationship. I just want to remind everyone, I don't want you to feel like we're comparing, right? This is all about 
learning from other people and experiences. So it's going to be fun to dive into some of these questions because we have two couples who are coming from different experiences and how their marriages started and how their lives started together. So um, Linda, if I could start with you, and oh. I'm going to put you on the spot first. Um, <laughs> Um, and by all means, this is a, you know, a conversation. So is as much as I'm mediating this and, and moving things along, if Dan and Monica, if you have any suggestions or ideas or a story pops in your head and you're like, I can relate, I want everyone to feel like they can um, interact, even if I'm just asking a question to one person. So um, Linda, I want to start with you. After 51 years of being together, how does it feel right now? How is it different, the feeling of love, than it was when you guys first met? I think that it gets stronger every single year, Danielle. Um, there's just something that happens as these years go by that makes the person more and more special to you. And I always tell Ed that Right now, even when I see him walk into a room or I hear his voice, my heart still does a flip-flop. So I think that the love is here to stay. <laughs> that, that's, that's a great way to put it because, I mean, even just as a, a person who just started her marriage, um, it's, it's, it's nice to know that that's true, right? I mean, that it still is just innate in you, that flip-flop, that's the word that keeps coming to my mind. It's like, it doesn't, it's the butterflies, right? Like they don't really go yeah. away. Yeah. I think they call that atrial fibrillation. <laughs> <laughs> I told you this was not a medical conversation. <laughs> yo, so yo, what do you, how do you? How do you make that last like what do you think is the you know i'm just gonna go there like if you could yeah. name a thing or an element or maybe it's a mood what is it that you feel like makes that last after 51 years i think that ed just gave you a really good example and that is the use of humor um we laugh a lot together uh we cry together we communicate a lot um but to me, it's uh, just knowing that someone is always there for me that has my back, that um, is looking out for me. And I think that, go ahead, I think. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. See, it's, it's not that I'm the disabled person and Ed is just looking out after me. He feels that I look after him too. And you're, I don't know, I don't want to call it your duties in marriage, but um, the things that you do to keep the marriage going or just to keep life going become kind of an even split. Uh, you know, I can do things that he can't and he can do things that I can't. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 I love the, just the simple saying of I got your back, right? Like. You, you think of like a team sport or or like a best friend and you're like I got your back but like if you know it's for life and it's someone who you know loves you in that way forever then it, it's such a, a a warm feeling to know like you're, you feel safe right it's like this this right. comfort knowing that someone has your back exactly. and you're right you start to identify those things that you're good at or or that you take on as your duties or responsibilities but i bet you guys don't feel like they're responsibilities i bet you feel like they just kind of fell in and became they did. They, they, yeah they absolutely did and uh i'll let ed tell you how we have decided to divvy up things in our marriage go for it divvy up but you know when you see each other and you say i love you uh, you know i love you more type thing well we have a, a deal 51 percent when we got married i said sometimes we're going to disagree on something i told her that if it's something like career move or something like that for me i'm going to take 51 percent because somebody oh. has to break the tie but at any time if you feel something is important to you 
that it's so important you want to take 51 percent you say that and it's a it, it's a deal we have to i have to follow that so tell her what you do that views on that <laughs> <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of funny, Daniel. I just put one of them down. I, the only time I've ever used 51% in our whole marriage was that I wanted a cat. And so I've had two cats. <laughs> I used 51% to say that I wanted a cat. <laughs> well, I don't like cats, but that's her 51%. So now I have a outside question that's more personal. Ed, do you like the cats? He likes me a lot more than I like him. Every time I sit down, he's in my life. Oh, that's hilarious. I love that. I think that's huge. Like, I want to take notes for my own relationship. Not because I'm ready to claim to 51%, but it's such a beautiful way. Like, like just, um, I one word that bothers me, and maybe this is personal, maybe we can bring this up, but the word compromise has always felt like a wall goes up, right? Like mm -hmm. I've got to now defend my side of it or like, what do I not want to compromise, right? So when you say it like that, when you bring up like this idea that we're all on an even playing field, but somebody has to break the tie, you better be willing to say, this is definitely something right. that really means something to me. Right. And then it, then the other person probably doesn't feel like it's so much of a compromise, but they actually see it from the other person's perspective. Um, so Ted or um, Ed, what are your what are your uh, fifty one percent? What did you uh, have you claimed any? I think I think the only one I can remember, and she'll tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, I was a nursing home administrator. <laughs> I I have a new tooth, and it's like something on the roof of my mouth temporary and so I have a list and I'm, I'm still learning how to talk with this but I was a nursing home administrator and it was a lot of pressure and it was it was good money but I felt it was going to kill me in time so I said I've got to get out of it and she said you know can we afford to and I said I'm taking the 51 percent because I want to be around for a while and I went I went into another career with hospice, it was so much better that I loved much more. Isn't that awesome? I love it. This is that's a really great tip. If if anyone's writing anything down or taking notes on love, I'm writing down 51%. I, I, it's like you don't need any more explanation for that. It's just a great tool. And that's what I feel like all of these tips or advice or information you guys hear tonight should feel like is just another tool to put in your tool belt. You know, I, I don't always like to say take things with a grain of salt, take it fully, but assert it, you know, discern it for you. Like, how does this work in your life? Or how does this relate if you're in a relationship? Can are you in a position to communicate on a deeper level with your your spouse and possibly bring 51% into your relationship? Maybe that could could help. Um, I wanna I wanna switch things over to Dan and Monica for a minute. Um, and actually, before I ask you that question, have you guys ever heard of the 51% or do you guys have anything similar or anything like that? Um, so no, I don't have the 51%, but I'm taking notes. Um, <laughs> but I find, it, I find it interesting that you've each only used it like once or twice. Uh, so, but, but that really goes to what I was gonna, going to talk to is, uh, Monica and I have uh, the wonderful attribute. We we agree on just about everything uh, for the most part, and uh, it's very rare that we you know disagree to the point where you know we're so dug in. I can't I can't even remember um, if, if if we have a disagreement. You know, usually one or the other you know has has a more you know vested interest or is more passionate about it and you can see that you can see you know usually tell that in the other person and when i see that coming out of monica i'm like you know hey obviously this means a lot to her uh, i'm just happy she doesn't want a cat and uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, and, and move aside and move on and uh, so uh, don't get me wrong you know we, we've had a couple 
conversations before. Um, it's communicating, right? It's it's not it's not just giving half the story or or just the snow-capped mountains of the story. It's communicating why something's important or why you feel a certain way, and you know so, something like what Ed was talking about about a career change uh, of why he wanted to do that career change. You know, there, there's a whole backstory to that. And I, I think anyone that loves you and hears, you know, something that you're coming to them with and why, uh, they're, they're going to hear that and they're, you know, they're they're going to agree. You know, it's not it's not compromising. It's hey, I you know, I, I hear what's coming out of you and I love you and I I I, I want your life easier, right? So, um, what were you going to say? Well, I mean, it's it's. Very true. I think that it's the same kind of idea of seeing, you know, that 51% is basically just putting a, a name to it. You know, it's like, this is that important to me. And um, so I think it's the same thing. It's just that they've come up with a great way to just get to the point. This is 51%. You know, <laughs> and the, and the conversation makes it so much easier, right? Um, but I, I think it is very important. And even with like periodic paralysis, dealing with that is, you know, there's times where I don't want to go to the hospital and he respects that until there is a point where I need to go to the hospital. And, uh, you know, so even in things of periodic paralysis, is he respects my decisions. Um, even though he may feel that I should have gone two hours before. <laughs> I'm slowly packing in the background. So that, I think that's really hard for some people. Yeah, that's beautiful. And you know, there's a there's a there's the natural true balance of things. The balance isn't always on the surface and obvious and written down and we know exactly what we're supposed to do in but like there are gonna there are more likely those moments when maybe you're not on the same page but like you said dan's respecting your your choice because it's your body and you know it the best and he's he's not just respecting what you're asking or saying but he's respecting you as the authority of someone who understands what's going on with your body and he's but at the same time, he's going, I'm going to make sure I'm doing everything I can possible to be ready for any, you know, for that moment for, I mean, totally different topic, but what comes to mind is anybody who's about to have a baby, right? You have like that bag, like pre-packed because you don't know when. So there's a bag in the balance of like, I we're going to give Monica her space and, and let her process this, but I'm but I'm sure, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a level of alertness there that's a little different for you too, right? Like when you're packing in the background, okay. you gotta be more- <laughs> For sure. For sure, for sure. Um, uh, just, just a segue also back to kind of what we were talking about before. Um, you know, with the 51%, uh, I guess is what we're talking about and calling it, giving it a name, um, it's, it's the communicate communications key, right? It's communicating why you why you want that fifty one percent say. Um, you know, if you, if you just said if 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 you just said I want the pack, and without any explanation or further discussion, you know that's that really only that doesn't tell all the story. Or if Ed said, you know, I I want to change a career uh, without giving the backstory, so. It's the communication part that is the, the huge foundation that maybe a lot of people don't do that would make things so much smoother, so much easier um, if you communicate. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, just as human beings, right? That's our challenge, right? It's like communicating and being understood or understanding someone else. So definitely in a relationship, it's like, you know the healthy relationship can't be there without it, right? Without that ongoing open communication. Um, I wanna just switch gears for just a minute on a different topic and um, more about uh, the side of uh, trust um, or, or kind of actually what we were going into with, with leading into 
periodic paralysis and how you're how you handle the, you know different situations that come up. So I want to bring it back to um, Linda for a minute. Um, when you and maybe there's a two part question here because I kind of want you to think about the beginning of your relationship and maybe how it's changed now or what grew from it. Um, but if you were to say that that Ed is the one that you trust the most in your life, what is it a what is it that defines that trust in Ed versus maybe someone else that you trust in your life? Um, it, it can, and and maybe here's another thing to keep in mind: words sometimes can't really communicate what we need to get across. So even just talking it out um, is a big part of this. Is that communication right? So don't feel like you have to have some perfect answer when I ask you a question. <laughs> now, um, for me, trust in him has built over the years, but. Ed is a very kind man. He's he's always been a very kind man. So when we first started dating, uh, I I knew that I had something, but at that point, um, many many years ago, I didn't have the name periodic paralysis to put to it. So uh, it it was just hard for me to try and explain to you know any man that I was dating. What exactly was happening to me when all of a sudden I couldn't get up, get up out of the chair to, you know, leave a movie or something like that? But again, I think it was Ed's sense of humor and his uh, ability to just be so kind to me and um, go along with the situation because he had a medical background. He wasn't scared about what was happening. Uh, that we were able to just form this trusting relationship and some I, I'll, I'll just give you one example of you know the humorous side of it um, because it happened many times and we we just laugh our heads off at it now but we we were living in Connecticut we both grew up in Connecticut and uh, one year the Giants were building their new football stadium in New York. So the Giants were playing at Yale Bowl and we had season tickets to go watch the Giants play. And this was a cold, probably Sunday that we went to this game and we're sitting in Yale Bowl and um, we're drinking hot toddies. You know, I'm, so I'm drinking liquor, I'm cold. I'm, I had no treatment for periodic paralysis whatsoever. And when it got time to leave the game, you know, everybody else gets up and they're walking out of the stadium and I'm sitting there and I am like a rock. I can't move. And Ed says, okay, we're going. And I said, no, we're not. And uh, luckily we were there with some other people and a couple of Ed and then one other man just grabbed me under the arms and they just kind of dragged me out of the stadium and we had to go through a tunnel. They dragged me through the tunnel and then Ed stuck me to a telephone pole and he said, hang on to it because I still had my arms that were used, you know, I could use my arms. So he stuck me to the telephone pole and all these people are walking by me, emptying out of the stadium and going, we've never seen anybody that drunk. <laughs> they, had, they had to get stuck to a telephone pole. <laughs> so, so anyway, he got the car and he drove it to my telephone pole and picked me up and threw me in the car. And by heating up the car, and then getting me back to my apartment. By the time we got back there, even without medication, my potassium had started to right itself. And by the heat in the car, I was able to get out and get into my apartment. But it did leave me weak afterwards. So we, we've had a lot of situations like that that um, have just been funny. I have one to add. Um, I broke a collarbone oh. at work. <laughs> And I think we were, were going to a movie theater. Yeah, we were. We were. And she fell. On the, on the ice. And she's on her knees. And I'm standing there because I can't lift her. I can't do anything. 
So she kind of worked my body to get up. And I think all the people around probably looked at that son of a bitch isn't even helping her. <laughs> <laughs> there is a picture. That's a picture right there. You, and I'm sure, I'm sure in the moment it wasn't as funny as it is. It no, 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 in the moment. But, yeah, it was terrifying. But. When I want to tell everybody, my shoulder is broken. My God, well, I can't. I'm not that yeah. bad. <laughs> What I'm just curious, personally, what did it feel like to to hold yourself up to that telephone pole and wait? What was that waiting period like? When we think about trust, <laughs> she was hoping I was going to come back. I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> that that really was truly it, Danielle, because this wasn't really far into our relationship. I'm thinking, what if he never does come back? What if he leaves me stuck to this telephone pole? So that was really a point when I had I had to trust him. I had to trust that he was going to come back and get me off that pole and also deal with all these people that are calling me a drunk at the same time. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was really... Um, it was scary at the time, and yet periodic paralysis, when you've had it from the time you were born, um, it's not particularly scary because you you just think, well, that's what people's bodies do. That's that's the normal thing, you know. Okay, it's happening again, and I happen to be by a telephone pole this time. But I was so used to having this happen at that point. Um, even though I didn't know what it was, it was just sort of a, you know, a matter of course. Uh, I, I wasn't worried that I wasn't going to be okay or anything. I just wanted to make sure I stayed there. Well, there's something to be said for that mindset though too, because you really can only build trust with someone if you're in a trusting space, right? So you, you know, you're, you're standing there and you have a choice to make on how you want to present yourself in that moment right in any given moment we have that choice but when we're when we're presented with scary moments or any kind of negative moment it's much easier to go into that downward spiral and then there would have been no chance for that trust to to show up right so right. there's a balance there and not just opening yourself up to trusting but also trusting what's in your head and in your heart that I'm making the right choice that I'm that he is going to be there. And obviously he came and rescued you from the telephone he call. He, he, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he rescued me. He was like the prince who showed up in his sports oh, car. He rescued me. He oh, you look at the sports car. Maybe it was all about the car, Ed. <laughs> he thinks that's true. <laughs> I remember giving her the car keys one time. She wanted to go somewhere. And I watched her drive off, wrong, wrong, and I'm going, I hope I see that car again. <laughs> well, here's a perfect segue into another version of trust. I'm kidding. <laughs> like, um, so, Ed, like, I know this might seem like a, a really obvious question, but how do you know that Linda trusts you? Like, we can say based on what she just said she's grown to trust you but how do you know that what comes from you that know that you get that communication from her um that she trusts you and and maybe there's some blips there like maybe there are some times when you're unsure about that level of trust one of the things like when when she takes a bath we we'll use a shower chair and when we first started using it she didn't totally trust me to be able to make sure she didn't fall. But over time, now I don't feel that anymore. I mean, she totally trusts me. And mm -hmm. that takes a lot of trust to know that you're hoping they're going to keep you from falling. Right. Yeah. So it took time. It was just a repetition, a matter of building that trust over repeating the same pattern um, before both people got comfortable and, and, and built in that. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. What do you think more in like the, 
the emotional side of things. Like, do you remember that moment when you had to go get the car and Linda was stuck there on the pole or, or any moment like that, maybe more recently where you're like, all right, I know she is having to trust me right now. And, and this is, this is my next move, right? To, to get back to her, whatever that may be. Are there any, I, in my mind, it's like a rescue scenario. Um, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. Uh, I, I think not, yeah. not, not recent. But we've been together so long that the trust is understood. It's a given. I understand she trusts me and she understands yeah. I trust her. And like, if I was in the hospital, if, give me an example, um, I had eye surgery. And when I was coming out of it, I, after the surgery, I'm not supposed to do anything strenuous. I'm not supposed to sit up, turn my head or anything. And when I came out of the anesthesia, I was becoming agitated. And they kept telling me to keep, stay down or whatever. And I kept asking for Linda. So they brought her back into, into the room where I was. And as soon as she was there, I was fine. I knew everything was all right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an intrinsic trust, right? Like there you don't even have to have words or thoughts. It's just your whole body changes because you know that that person's there and anything that happens from here forward, you feel safe. Gonna look out for me. Yeah, yeah. How about you guys, Dan and Monica? If um if you know, I mean, obviously trust is a big deal even at the beginning or, or you know, we don't have to have 51 years to create that trust, right? Um, so what, what do you feel, uh, Dan, establishes a healthy trust um, in your relationship? Well, I think, I think, uh, I think trust, you know, trust isn't, it's never any one event, right? That gains trust. It's, it's a series of small things built up over time that, you know, you build this trust, but you can lose the trust in one event. You can't build the trust in, in, in one event. So it's really? just it's those little things that, that you're there for them. You're, uh, you know, you're their rock. Um, and I, I think, I think for 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 us, um, it, it's just it's just been that slow, steady building over. You know, again, we don't have fifty-one years, but I I like our seven. Um, I think it's still strong. Um, but it's, it's it's been built up over time, and you know, I, I would I would think asking Monica, because um, because you know, it's it's definitely with her having periodic paralysis, I can only imagine, you know, like, like Linda grasping onto a telephone pole or, or a light pole. I, I don't know what that feeling is. Um, I'm sure Monica can, you know, totally understand what that, what that's like. Um, and now, now do I think like if I was grabbing a, a telephone pole, do I, do I feel like Monica would drive off? No, of course. Of course I have that trust, right? <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> so, so, but, but I don't, I don't have that, that fear, right? The, I mean, that's that's a fear that's inside her, inside Linda. Um, that Ed and Ed and I, you know, we we have other things, I'm sure, but that that's got to be very scary. That's got to be a very scary thing. Well, I think so too. Is one of the things, I, I had to learn what trust meant. Um, I, I always thought that trust meant you gave your trust to somebody and they were supposed to take care of it, right? You trust that they're gonna do what they say or say what they do type of thing. And then I learned that trust is actually, you know, about what's inside of you and trusting yourself and trusting that, um, you know, whatever that feeling is, whatever, you know, that type of a thing. Um, but it's also about vulnerability. Um, but trust and vulnerability, they, they're together. So you're vulnerable, right? Either your emotions, you're vulnerable, both your emotions or you're vulnerable physically. Um, and the trust comes from that person's actions or words or intention, right? So, so when you have periodic paralysis, I'm someone who, I have, of course, genetically um, 
um, diagnosed. I've had my whole life, but I never knew that's what it was. And it, I never had that vulnerability until I was in my 30s where I couldn't move. And at some time I couldn't even speak. And that is when I realized I had trust issues because I did not know how to maneuver my life being vulnerable to that to that level of vulnerability and that is about oh probably 10 years ago and i had to go to therapy and learn how to be vulnerable and get over my trust issues um that were most people most people could walk around their entire life and have trust issues and never it, it never really get to the point where it did with me because they they're not in that vulnerable place where you have to trust and you know everyone around you on some level and um so trust is huge trust is huge in relationships and all relationships doesn't matter if it's platonic romantic if it's your you know your family members your neighbor it's trust is huge and um and one of the other things that i had to learn with the vulnerability and then the trust was intention right because Dan might do something with the best intentions, like take me to the hospital when I don't want to go to the hospital. He may have the best intentions, but then that might make me struggle with trusting him in a vulnerable position because I don't want to go to the hospital. And so those are the kind of things, those are the kind of challenges that most relationships will probably never have to deal with. Um, but when you have a chronic illness, you're just, it's just thrown in there. And so it, it can make things a little bit more difficult, but trust but it also, vulnerability. It, it, it's, there's, I always try and look for not just the silver lining, but I feel like in any wrong or mistake or, you know, thing you're not used to and you had to learn from, there's a lesson there, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're going through this experience with another person and you're building trust, um, you're both learning from even the mistakes or the moments where maybe there was a great intention and the outcome wasn't as great. But if, if there can be this just underlying understanding that you're growing together and um, this mistake can be communicated, right? Um, but but it's being aware that that intention is what matters to the trust, right? It wasn't necessarily yeah. the mistake or the thing that he that he did that was labeled wrong, but it was the it was the original action or intention for the action to begin with that is where that trust comes from. And I I can only imagine the difficulty let alone with any illness and now you're you're talking about an illness that many people don't understand or know about and those of you who have this illness are probably the best people to understand what's going on with your body even if you aren't fully aware of what's going on so you're not only having to build trust right but you're building trust within this um this time that you're building trust with your own body right so it's I, I assume there's there's like two layers to it, right? You're trusting even Lindo, you were talking about like the shower chair. It's like you you want to completely rely on Ed because you have to, you have to trust him. But at some point you're also just trusting that what you feel in your body is is what you expect, right? When you're moving through using this new uh chair or whatever. So long story short, like where I'm coming from here is I feel like it's it's an internal thing just as much as it is in recognizing yeah. it in your person. Yeah. yeah. Very, very 100%. much. hundred percent. Right, exactly. And and so many people, you know, most people have trust issues. I mean, it's, it's just how it is. And like I was saying, you might be able to maneuver your life, like most people might be, be able to maneuver their lives and it never really become a big issue. I mean, it's always going to be an issue, but a huge issue, like, deteriorating a relationship, a friendship, or a romantic, really, or even a work, you know, uh, relationship. But it's, it's when you have that chronic illness, especially ours, which leaves us totally vulnerable, totally, like, there are times where we can't feed ourselves, or we, you know, totally vulnerable. If, if you have that trust, it's just going to bring those issues 
even higher um, yeah. and, and make it almost a deal breaker or or make it, it makes so that the look at it right it it, it, mm -hmm. it like forces those those situations to the surface because you're there's no there's no give and take there's a moment where you have nothing but you have to trust so you have to. and what if you're with someone you can't trust that's yeah. the other problem, you know, and that might not, and again, these aren't always romantic relationships. These are, you know, and, and what I mean by you can't trust them, doesn't mean that they're going to like rob from you or something like that, but like trust that they are going to respect your, you know, your decisions or respect um, the situation or not become angry with you. Like, like when I hear Linda and Ed's story, you know, it, it does tell a lot about Ed in a sense of he understands, you know, he trusted that what Linda was going through, she had no control over because some people become angry because they don't trust that you're being honest, right? They think that you're faking it or you could do this, but you're just lazy or, and then they become angry with you. And then there's a whole other part. So it's not just trusting the person who's vulnerable. It's also that person you know right me i have to trust that uh you know dan will help me right but then dan also has to trust that i'm being honest about what's really happening to my body so it, it goes both ways right totally, totally yeah and and there's some you know dan said at the beginning but i feel like it's going to come up a lot it's like that trust is really only possible to get built better and better and better with communication like if when you're let's say if you're listening in and you're trying to define what level of trust maybe you have with the people in your life maybe this is the first time you're you're really thinking about this on a broader level i mean like monica said you didn't even know you had trust issues right so maybe you're out there and you're thinking about these things or the people whether it's a spouse or or a platonic relationship and you can kind of decipher at what level of trust you're at with people and maybe it is an internal trust that you can build up more, or maybe it's just a level of communication. Because sometimes it can just be a simple sentence or the way you say something, and it totally changes that trust level, right? Just, I mean, imagine the times when you've had something in your head and you, you're like afraid to say it out loud, but when you do, it makes the other person feel relieved or grateful or you know happy. So there's something about trust and communication that really go hand in hand when you're building it, right? In the end, you guys have it, it's a given. You don't really have to commu communicate it so much, but I feel like at the beginning, there's a lot of communication to build what that trust is gonna look like in the long term, right? And, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to go to counseling by yourself or as a couple. I mean, it's, it's basically just finding the tools, identifying, you know, because trust, especially with a chronic illness, and again, it's both people trusting each other. I mean, that can be a huge issue in a relationship, a huge issue. And um, so, yeah, there's no shame in going and, and getting counseling or or even reading books about trust, you know? Um, but yeah, def and vulnerability. Definitely. Yeah. And we're going to, I definitely want to make sure we touch on a few of those other tools, if you will, as we keep going with this, because I think it's important to point out that um, we, we don't always have to know the answer, right? And a lot of times we, it is okay to go look for help outside of just the two people that are in that relationship. And quite often it's, it, it can be necessary to, to, reconvene and see each other the right way again so i definitely want to make sure we hit on a couple of those topics of those tools like counseling and things like that as, as we keep going um and if you're listening in and you have questions i just want to remind everyone we're we're we've got a, a bunch of great questions we're we're chiming in and talking to these two great couples here but of course you guys are here to listen in live so we want you to feel like if you have questions for yourself or ideas that come up when you're listening to these conversations, please write them down. Please know that we're gonna be coming, um, we're gonna open up the mics at the end of this and allow people to ask these questions live here. So keep your questions if you have them. Um, don't think we're not gonna get to them, we will. 
uh, and and I'm gonna keep going here. I wanna um, I wanna ask, uh, kind of still touching a little bit on the topic of trust, but shifting gears a little bit. Um, I'll go back to Linda here. So this is kind of a twofold question. Is it possible to trust more than one person? And I'll take it a step further. Is it tr possible to trust something other than a person? Maybe oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Ab ab absolutely. Um, I, I, I think that right now um, I trust a lot of people because now I have, first of all, I have a caregiver who helps me and I have to trust her. And it's a relationship that has to be built over time, just like I built a relationship with Ed. I mean, it's not a romantic relationship, but it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a trust relationship. But probably the other most trusting relationship I have had is with the two service dogs that I've had, because I trust them to take care of me when I am in a vulnerable position. And um, until you have one of these dogs and see what they can do and the independence that they can give you, it's, it's very hard to explain. Um, and I, I watch it over and over. You know, I go to all the graduations that we have for uh, these dogs and I watch other people get matched with these dogs and the stories that they tell. It's, um, it changes their lives in such a positive direction that, uh, I, I don't know, it just, it brings tears to your eyes every time you see it happen. And um, I, I've told Ed, I mean, I can look at my dog Valentine and feel this tremendous love for him that I'm not sure is repeated in anybody else than Ed um, because he gives me such a level of uh, devotion. devotion. Yeah, it's absolute devotion that he gives to me. I mean, yeah. some, sometimes to the point where I think I'm going to be smothered by his devotion, but I mean, he, you know, because he, he likes to stand up on his hind legs and practically give me a hug or if I'm laying in bed, he covers me with his entire body. But these, these are all things that he has learned to do because he knows that they can help me. So it's not like he's misbehaving. These are things that I can give him commands to do. And uh, it's, uh, it's very comforting and um, I adore him. I, I absolutely adore him. <laughs> He is, he is cute as can be, and I, I'll just throw in my own personal story. The first time I met, I want to ask you, Monica, about your four-legged friend as well, but the first time I met both of them together was in Dan's office, and I, as someone who does not have a service animal and does not have a chronic illness, but has grown up with dogs and hunting dogs and trained dogs. So I appreciate and know the level of intelligence they can have. But the joy of watching them switch into, I'm allowed to play. Mom yeah. gave me permission to play. And then watching them like just switch and just be playful. That was beautiful too, because they really have to be intelligent creatures if they know that they're now off and then up, oh, now I'm on. Right. And I can I can only imagine the amount of not just trust you have put in them, but, you know, there's something to be said when they're not human. It's almost easier to believe their trust. Right. You you yes. see that emotion and you know they're not tricking you or manipulating you and you you just you take it for for face value and you know you can. Um, so. He trusts that he's going to get fed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know what kind of relationship Dan has with the dog. <laughs> um, so, Linda, you mentioned that you had two service dogs, correct? You have Valentine now. Yeah, Valentine. And first, I had Keith. 
and Keith retired and he actually went to live with uh, Dr. Levitt that everybody who is a member of the PPA knows. And he unfortunately only lived for one year with Jake uh, and then he passed away of cancer, but Jake gave him the most extraordinary life you could ever imagine. And he needed to get out of the hot weather in Florida. So he went up to Jake in New York and uh, it, it wasn't sad for me. It was, um, they, they had had a connection prior to me ever giving him up as a service dog. And to see him with Jake was just absolutely beautiful. Um, I loved it. I loved getting the pictures. I did get to see him again. And he remembered me, but he was immediately back with Jake. He wanted to be there with him. So, uh, yeah. so how long was Keith your service dog? Uh, about eight years, about eight years. And then did you, um, did you immediately know that you wanted to get another oh, dog? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, I, I've, I've had a lot of dogs in my life and pets, other pets. And I know that when, when a dog dies, they leave a little piece of themselves in your heart. And I think that by now my heart is practically all dog because I have had to say goodbye to so many. But that piece that they leave with you is so special that, um, uh, I mean, a, a dog's love is unconditional. Yeah. And I like to think that um, my love for people is unconditional. Even people that I'm just meeting and the people that I'm helping on the PPA um, that are contacting me and we're talking to, you know, I'm talking to them all the time. Uh, it's, I really feel something for these people because I know what they're going through. So yes, it's, um, I don't know. It, it's weird. It's, it's kind of like I'm living their life along with them. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to put words in that feeling and yeah. that's okay, you know, it, it, we do, but I, I get what you mean when, when I get what you're saying, when it comes to like putting your, your, you feel like you are them because you are having to be so vulnerable and trust and both right. of you on both sides and opening up that conversation. So, and, and just getting back to our four legged friends, they, they feel that, without having a voice to communicate they right you see it in the way they are and and that's how you know that devotion is there Absolutely. Um, monica i understand that you have recently or somewhat recently um started your journey with a service dog so do you want to talk a little bit about fozzy and your trust with our new kind of trust right so first, um, getting a service dog was a big decision for us. We already had two dogs. Um, it was, I, I am, I, I'm pretty high functioning most of the time. Um, so it was like, well, what do I do with the dog the rest of the time? You know, it was, it was just one of these things like, do I really need a service dog? And it, and it came down to um, an emergency situation. Um, the paramedics thought I was drinking and and they were very delayed getting me to the hospital and I had very serious um, heart arrhythmias during my episode that you know were not good that they took so long because they weren't taking me serious and um, for years Linda's been like Monica you need to get a service dog you need to get a service dog and um, my doctor after the episode came into the doctor's office you know to see him after being released from the hospital he walked in, the first thing he said to me was, where's your service dog? And so it really made me think about it. And um, we did, we decided to get a service dog. We went a different route than Linda, um, mainly because Dan's pretty much, a, he's allergic to dog hair. Um, so we got a poodle and so we had to get a trainer and stuff. It was the best decision. It was a hard decision because I, I didn't know if, if I, if I was going to need a service dog um, as much as I, you know, if it was worth it. 
but then also, you know, I didn't like the idea of having a, the way I say it is a neon sign that I have a disability. You know, everywhere I go, I have this dog that has this vest that has this, and I, 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 like, I like to camouflage. I guess that was part of my trust, right? I, I didn't trust that people could accept me if they knew that I have this condition. Um, and so I went ahead and I, we, and, and it, was a, it was a big decision. Like I said, we had two other dogs. And so we decided and we moved forward. Best decision I ever made. Um, now, um, if, if, God forbid, if I am by myself again and I have an episode, going back to that, you know, feeling like somebody's got your back. Fozzie is his name. He's got my back. Fozzie's got my back. Um, and I, the days that I'm normally, when, before I had Fozzie, I would be nervous to leave the house by myself. Because God forbid, what if something happens, right? And now I... I feel I have my confidence back. I have my independence back. I, um, he actually has two pouches that carry my medication, that carry directions, because sometimes when I have an episode, I'm not able to speak. And I will say, there's a little guilt. There's a little guilt. I don't know if Linda will, can agree with me on this. There's a little guilt when it comes to my other dog. Because he's special. I'm sorry. And I feel so guilty because <laughs> I've had my dogs before I had him. But there is this difference. And, and you know what I think it is? Is that the dynamics of the relationship between him and I is different than the dynamics between me and my, my other dogs. I take care of them, right? Fozzie takes care of me. And there's just this different connection he goes everywhere. He's my shadow. No matter where I am, he's with me. And he knows. Like, he knows me so well. He actually knows me better than I know myself. And, um, but yeah, it is a completely different relationship than any animal I've ever had in my life. So. <laughs> so, when did you get fuzzy? How long ago? It was a uh, almost a year and a half ago, and he was oh. twelve weeks. We got him as a puppy. Oh wow, he was a puppy. So, so talk to me a little bit about what it feels like now versus at the beginning when it when it comes to trust. Like not just trusting that he's going to get trained or knows what he's doing, but like that whole relationship. Like that's still fresh. You know, it's it's good now. I'm sure, but. That's still fresh in your mind on what it was like to build that trust, I'm sure, right? So for him, the, we, the other reason we went a different route with um, um, Fozzie was because my episodes don't always present the same way. And so the trainer recommended that if I got a dog that was young, that it would get to see a lot of my episodes because my episodes can be just paralysis. My, my, I, I have paramyotonia, so it is, I can be paralyzed or I can have something that looks like a seizure or severe muscle contractions. And so, and it, and it can come on fast, it can come on slow. And Fozzie, one of the things that we trained him to do, because my symptoms always can, they can look very different, is if I'm in distress, that's all I have to be is in distress. It doesn't need to look a certain way. I just have to be in distress he will react. One of the things that he does is he alerts the people around me. So, cause I am, I do go out a lot by myself. And if let's say for instance, I'm in a department store in a, in a dressing room and I have an episode, he will bark, 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 bark. They know, okay, something's wrong. They come into the room. I could be there for hours, right? If, 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 if he didn't alert to them. Um, and then he also will alert, um, He's also, so this is the funny thing is that it, sometimes you think that they don't remember something and Linda will probably agree with this because it's been so long since they've had, since they've had to do it. But then the second you need them to do it, they, they've got it. They're like, I got this. Oh yeah, I remember this. This is what I'm supposed to do. And um, so they are amazing. They're absolutely amazing. And 
It's funny. Um, it's like you have to in those moments when you're like, is he gonna remember this? That's you building your trust in in him, right? Like you're like, I'm supposed to trust that he can do this, but in my mind, I'm not quite sure. And then he proves it to you when you didn't, ex you weren't sure if he could or not, or if he remembered it. So there's a exactly. there's there. It, it's very, it's like it, the the last episode I had, which was in October that I ended up in the hospital, I was in an elevator by myself. And all of a sudden I was like, this isn't gonna, I'm not, I'm not okay. And luckily I, I do acupuncture roughly about every 10 days. So he was familiar with the building. He knew where we were going. And my myotonia had, you know, the pair of myotonia had kicked in and it was very hard for me to move my muscles. I just grabbed his harness and he helped me walk to the office. Um, and um, I was able to get a help. But I mean, it's stuff like that. Like he was never trained to do that. He was never trained. Okay, now he may need you to walk all the way. He was never trained to do that. He on his own was like, don't worry, mom, I got this. And he took me there. And again, I had to trust that he was going to take me to the right place. And he did and everything perfectly. So I, I, just a few times I've seen you both with your service dogs. I, I could distill down every single moment that is just a given level of trust. Um, that, like I said before, it, it, it has to grow, but it becomes intrinsic. It becomes a natural knowing. Um, and that's true in any relationship. I know we've been talking about our four-legged friends and, and how they help us with periodic paralysis, but that it's like, there's this growth to build up that trust. And Dan said it earlier, you can get rid of it in one foul swoop, but it takes a long time to build it. So once you have it, I think the thing I've learned from this part of the discussion is you you can't take it for granted. You know, you have to appreciate knowing that trust is there. Um, even though it is a given, uh, we can't take it for granted because it is rare and it's few and far between. I mean, how ladies, both of you talking to Linda and Monica for those, and you can think about this if you're listening in and you have periodic paralysis, for those of us who are who have a chronic illness, how many people, I mean, do you really feel like you can trust to that level, to the level that you trust your spouse or maybe your service dog? Is there really anyone else in your life that that you have had to to trust on that on that level? Well, I, I had to trust my parents when I was younger. Um, because my father also had periodic paralysis. Again, it was not known, but he was obviously disabled. Um, and yeah, you all through your life, I mean, there was never a time that I didn't have to trust someone. And you know, if you don't have that person around you, Danielle, I mean, if your trusted person isn't available, it is scary. It is so scary not to have that person around. Yeah, uh, I can only imagine. And, and for those who aren't in a relationship or haven't found, um, whether it's a, a, a romantic relationship or a caregiver or just a friend or, or a, spouse, a parent that they trust, I, I can't imagine what that's like, right? You, they're, they're having that person is, absolutely important to to your life and but it has also forced you to build that trust and i i think that by finding that person you both are stronger right you both have built a, a level of trust that um it only comes with with that connection with with building it together over time and and that's how it works i mean i can trust that door all day long to do what it's supposed to do but when there's another person there it's a, it's a give and take, right? There's only, it, like I said before, it's inside and it's on the outside. So it's interesting that as we're talking about this, I realized that I trust Monica. I would trust Monica with my life. And um, no questions asked because we have a relationship that I think we know each other well enough now that I would trust her implicitly. So that interesting that 
you're right, right? Like you might have just thought of that, but that was probably a given for both of you for the length of like you guys have built this great relationship as friends and colleagues and 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 you know volunteers together. So yeah, let's anybody listening, I think we should all take time to really try to identify maybe there are some other people in our life that we do trust more than we realize, or even just in opening up this kind of conversation with them and, and communicating, you can Absolutely. build that next level of trust with other people in your life for sure. Yeah. You're making me think of a friend of mine that I probably wouldn't have put that term on, but on wedding day, man, she was on it. She's like the friend I could trust. Um, <laughs> There is there is something to be said to finding a friend that way too. So I'm glad you brought that up for sure. Um, I'd love to switch gears again and and get into something that I don't know the listeners how much you guys are really thinking about this, but I know it's been a topic we've been um, wanting to discuss simply because it is uh, a difficult conversation to have, and we want this to feel like an open place for everyone, but. I want to dive into the lust side of things for a minute. Not that it has to be difficult, because I want to start with some simple, fun questions. Um, but first, let, I'll just open this up to everybody. It's a question I have, but it may seem obvious, but I want to kind of distill this down. What really is the difference between love and lust? Like, what is the difference for you, Linda, or, or anybody? Like real simple. We don't have to write a whole book about this, but like, what's the difference? <laughs> All right, I think Dan has the answer. I go first. I think it's uh, it's lust is shallow, right? Lust is something that is it is. Uh, it's physical, right? It's it's something that's not going to be able to keep a relationship going. But is it's there a, right, there's a part of it? But if it's all around lust, um, because it, I think it also is that idea of perfection, right? Is is you know it's it's that the you know oh look at the way that she moves or look at the way his muscles are you know we we age we you know our bodies don't look the same later and especially when you have a chronic illness you know i'm not wearing high heels out <laughs> you know that kind of a thing so um that's how i see it is lust fades man it, it fades it, it's not around to stay so that's i'm okay. Well, so, yeah, well, first of all, I mean, uh, I don't know about lust fading, it changes. But, well, I mean, if it's uh, just lust. If it's just lust. If it's just, if, if a relationship is based solely on lust, yeah. that's going to fail, yeah. uh, my opinion. Yeah. Um, but but you, you, uh, you always have to have some, some component of lust needs to be in, in, your, in your relationship. Yes. Right. <laughs> I think when, there's when a little lot going on over there on the right side of our screen. <laughs> when you when you first meet well, we somebody, <laughs> when you first meet somebody, it attracts you. It's you know it's yeah. physical, mm -hmm. unless you've be, been friends for a long time. But most relationships start physical. They look good to you. You know, there's something about them that attracts you. But yeah. over time, the relationship mentally, emotionally takes over being bigger than the lust part, the, the physical part. Mm -hmm. The physical part does not last the same forever that it, the way it started. But the no. other the other love can grow and grow. Uh, that's the perfect way to put it. So now, Ed, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. What made you get a, feel attracted to Linda when you first met her? What was the lust for you? Um, we met in a mixer. PG. PG. PG, she says. Be what? PG. We, we met in a mixer. 
I went to a school that was mostly men, and she went to an, was going to a, a educational school, a state educational school uh, that was mostly women. So there was a mixture at Southern Connecticut, which was a teacher's college, and myself and a friend went there to see if we could pick up a girl. And we got there late. I danced a couple of times. I was older. I was a veteran. And most of the people there were college, you know, not my age, a little bit younger. And they weren't really that impressed with me. And then they said, this is the last dance. So I'm looking around. OK, if I'm going to score, it's going to have to be right now. So she wasn't dancing. So I went up and asked her to dance. And we just talked for a little while after the dance. And I was transferring to her school the next semester. So the first day I went there, she was in a crossroads and was just standing there, just minding her own business when I walked by and, oh, hey, fancy meeting you here. Well, she had planned to find me that day. <laughs> so it's, it, it started off, I mean, at first, you can't tell right now, but when she was 19, she had a body that wouldn't quit. She was, <laughs> it was gorgeous. What a figure. And it was, there was a little lust there. <laughs> That's what I needed to hear. Just your honesty, okay? Just total honesty. Um, I love it. So I didn't know this. So wait, Linda, now I have to ask you the same question. You obviously felt the lust too, because you made sure that you saw him again. So what was that like for you? When we danced that last dance at the mixer, Danielle, and I, we have talked about this just recently because um, I still get the feeling when Ed holds me. And it doesn't mean that lust dies out just because we're old now. There is still lust there, but when he took me in his arms that night to dance, I felt like I fit. It was like my body and his body just melted together and we were one. I had never experienced that before with somebody. It's still the same, even though our bodies have changed. And we don't dance. And we don't dance. Um, <laughs> I'd like to dance, but we don't. Um, that feeling is still alive that um i don't know it's it's got a lot to do i guess with with trust with safety but also with um so just yeah the physical attraction the the feeling of bare skin against bare skin not not at the mixer but i mean <laughs> you know that's a hell of a picture <laughs> Risk case schools over there. No, but you're right. There's, there's, I mean, I don't need to get woo woo here, but I do truly believe in that energy exchange that happens, and you don't have to put some physical understanding to it or like proof in physical form. But when you say, I just fit, it's like, well, it's not a puzzle piece, you know, it's like, but in whatever way that that energy in that night and you guys wrapping your arms around each other. It stuck. That lust stuck. I love it. I love it. Um, uh, and now I have to ask the two of you, even though I already kind of sort of know the story. Um, I'll start with Dan on this one. What first attracted you to Monica? What was that lust factor? Like, tell us a little bit about where that came in at the beginning. Um, so actually, the first thing that attracted me to Monica was her laugh. Um, so, <laughs> uh, somewhat physical, right? I mean, but after, after hearing the laugh, you know, then I, you know, I looked at, you know, where was that laugh coming from? And, you know, certainly, uh, I, uh, I was very taken with her, um, to say the least. So, um, but no, it was her laugh that really caught me and, and then, you know, it, it, that was just really the start, and then just talking to her, and uh, she she just wasn't like, you know, uh, other other girls. 
<laughs> we always get around, you know, I'm technically not like other girls, but, you know, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's different, you know, and, and I think, though, that that that's one of the things that periodic paralysis, you know, has changed in me. I'm I am very authentic. What you see is what you get. And um, I think that that's um, a, a trait that many people with periodic paralysis eventually get, right? That, you know, that vulnerability, you're just like, hey, this is me. I'm sorry, my legs aren't working right now. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> it's very easy to be but, vulnerable once you get there, right? When you're just like, this is how I have to be. I'm, you're almost, you feel more comfortable just letting it be vulnerable, right? Than trying to uh, hold back. Yeah. Really. <laughs> Yeah, so we can back. Um, so, I mean, so, 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 so actually, before I first came, I actually had to watch a training <laughs> course, basically. Uh, she, she made me watch the video of, of uh, Dave putting himself into. On your first date? Before, before, <laughs> before the first date. I, I just want you to know what you're getting into. Sit down, sit down and watch this. <laughs> so, before it. it Wait, so, so, so like you probably noticed, Dan and I are not very young people, and the fact that we've been together for seven years, we obviously met each other when we were older in life. I was going through a divorce, and he was going through the end of a relationship, and, you know, as a single person, it's hard enough being 40 years old and, and dating, but being 40 years old and having a chronic illness that can make you totally paralyzed at any time made things a lot trickier. And so I want to be very open and honest before we get in this relationship. Hey, watch this video. This is what could happen. And um, honestly, I, I thought I would never hear from him again. I thought it would just be like, he would ghost me. Like, be yeah. like, me, like that thing. And um, I, then like the next day he called me and I was like, what? I was he, like, so what, what are we going to do? And I was like, did you watch the video? And he was like, yeah. And he goes, I said, well, he goes, I just have a few questions. And I was like, I was shocked. I was like, okay. And he said, well, one, you know, how often does this happen? And at that time, uh, I think it was probably happening maybe once a month. And I was like, yeah, maybe like once a month. He was like, okay. And then it goes away. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay. And then he asked, I don't remember what the other question was. Oh, that, you know, what, what, what do I need to look out for? Or, yeah. You know, and then, then we planned our first date, and um, it, episode three. Episode three, yes. Yeah. But it was, it was probably no. I had while we were dating, I had episodes, but he never witnessed any of them. And he would know that I was, you know, I'd be like, "Hey, I'm sick," and and everything. Uh, it was almost about two months before he actually witnessed it, and um, I don't know what was it like. Uh, uh, Monica uh, got me prepared very well, I think. <laughs> uh, between, between, watching the, between watching the video and just uh, talking it through, so I think I think when the first episode came, I think I was I was pretty prepared. It was so it was one of those times where I was not wanting to go to the hospital, and so I I had gotten food poisoning is how the episode came on. And um, he, I was on the couch, I was slurring my speech, I couldn't hold my head up, I mean, it was a lot of bad things. And he was slowly packing the so, car. So, 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 so I was, you know, she had told me the things to watch out for, so I'm, I'm almost looking down my checklist, right? And I'm like, yeah, she's got that, oh yeah, that's happening. You know? And she's like, no, I'm good, I'm good. I'm like, this checklist looks, looks <laughs> bad. Right. So uh, she she's sitting there saying she's but I'm kind of packing in the background. He packed the car. I dragged myself to the bathroom. I came out of the bathroom holding on to the wall and collapsed in his arms. He walked out to the car that was already running and was already <laughs> and put me in the car and drove me to the hospital. Now most people with periodic paralysis, when they have episodes, they don't need to go to the emergency room. Mine does affect my heart tremendously, and it also affects my breathing. Um, so I do need to go to the emergency room so they can um, monitor my heart, my breathing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that was uh, his, that's, he just was like, I took him to the cliff and just kind of like pushed him over. <laughs> it was 
full-blown medical emergency first episode is what he witnessed with me. I know now and we can laugh about it and, and we know this is obviously a serious converse, serious topic, but it is amazing that you guys, guys, the gentlemen, the husbands in the room, um, have the audacity to not show fear or to not be afraid, or maybe you are afraid, but you're still going to do the things on that checklist with while you're afraid. There's, I mean, that underlines love, trust. I don't know where lust goes in that scenario, but you're, there's something to be said for that. Like there's, that's a whole new layer of, all right, I'm here for this person. I've got this person's back, right? I mean, yeah, we're talking. But that, you know. but that in itself is very sexy, right? To have that person who, yeah. I mean, that is a very sexy thing for me is, is knowing that he he's there he's got my back and i mean i know they have like those calendars where the guy's like washing the dishes or vacuuming or whatever for me it's like you know he's 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 got my back he's if i need him and even with work if i'm bad and that's the thing is that when i tell him i need him he trusts that i really need him and he drops everything and he comes to me and um i mean it's very, uh, I don't know. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. It is, it is beautiful. And and to just jump back into the the topic of lust, it's beautiful that you guys can create that balance, right? I mean, we're talking about very serious situations that episodes that you guys have had to, obviously Monica's had to go through, but Dan's had to go through with her and it's been more than once and yet in between and daily life continues and that lust is still there and like you said monica it's not everything obviously but it is a part of keeping that joy going throughout the hard times i'm sure it is um uh so i I want to touch on a topic this is a question that was um brought to my attention i really didn't even think about it but it is personal to me as well. Um, do I want to ask about children, about having kids? And I know Monica that you have um, children, um, but I, Linda and, and Ed, you do not have children, correct? No, we um, don't. Did, did, was that a choice that you guys made together? If so, why? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we did. We did. We we actually. Um, it wasn't that far into our relationship when I learned that, yes, this probably was periodic paralysis. And I learned that at Yale uh, New Haven Hospital. And I was able to talk to a geneticist and he told me that there was a 50-50 chance of any children that we had were going to be affected. Um, I looked at my father and I knew that he had three out of four children affected. And I was also married to a man who really didn't want children. He really didn't. I mean, he, it would have been me that had pushed that. So um, we could have adopted. Uh, that's what my sister did. She adopted two wonderful children and they're very happy. But Ed and I, um, I don't know, maybe that's part of the lust. We have always felt like each other was enough. Um, it's, it has satisfied our needs and also that 51% of the cap, you know, it's, it's just. <laughs> Three times. <laughs> and I have 51% forever and ever. <laughs> I like what you said though, that you guys are enough. And I don't mean to bring this up. I don't want this to feel like a stereotypical question. I can tell you as someone who just got married, it is the next question on everyone's mind. When are you having kids? And personally, it's, it is, even without a chronic illness, it is, it is still yeah. something I, I don't question it, but I, I'm, I, um, I am not among all the women who just immediately assume that's what they're supposed to do. So I appreciate this question, just kind of just putting it out there for anybody, whether it has to do with PP or not. Um, but when, when we're talking to two couples who are happily married, um, 
and there's communication there, um, it, it is a curious topic of conversation as to why, right? Um, so I appreciate that. I didn't, I, I think I knew that there was a genetic um, chance, but I didn't realize that it was 50-50. And um, yeah. that, that, that's a good reason to, to make that choice, for sure. It, it is, and um, I, I don't know, it, it has enabled us, not having children has really enabled us to do so many other things, Danielle, and um, you know, we, we have both lived a very giving life. I mean, most of the things I've done in my life have been volunteering with different organizations. Um, and so I consider all of these people to be my family and all of their children to be my grandchildren. And um, I have close friends whose children are like our grandchildren. It, it, it's not something that I have terribly missed. It really wasn't. I, because you've created a family every, you know, and everybody you've connected with. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Right. Um, Monica and Dan, how about you guys? I know, I know you're not 51 years in. It's not like you would have kids in college and now, but. Well, I was gonna say, well, we got married. No one, no one's asking us. So why don't we have a kid? <laughs> but um, they know they're too old. Have children. I have two children from my previous marriages. I, my, my, my son is from my first husband, and my daughter is from my second husband. And unfortunately, both of my children have my genetic mutation. Um, which uh, Dr. Cannon was actually surprised because he said it was one in four chance and both of my children have it. Um, my sister had children and only her daughter has it. It is a huge topic <clears throat> when it comes to my niece and my daughter. Um, my son is um, gay, so you know his, him and his husband will probably adopt, so we don't have to worry about that genetic um, mutation going any further there um, but my niece and my daughter my daughter pretty much she's only 22 um, it, the other thing that comes with our genetic mutation I, I'm not sure why and it's not necessarily our genetic mutation but in my family is um, the women usually have to have hysterectomies um, at a, in like in their 20s so I in the back of my mind I kind of always knew that I had my children when I was young um, and my daughter my niece um, they're they're both in their 20s, and the they it's it's a lot of pressure on a young woman to be like, okay, you may or may not be able to have children. You need to make that decision now. Right. And 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 so my daughter basically is like, I don't see myself having any children. And the same with my niece Tori. Um, they may adopt one day, but they don't see having um, children of you know of their own uh, genetic. I I think, I mean, I know we're all grateful for the other ways. And in, in, in my mind, I hope this is maybe too optimistic, but I feel like there's, for everyone who doesn't have a child but wants one, there's one to adopt, right? Or in some, I feel right. like there's there's a yeah. parent and a, and a child for everybody who wants to create a family. It's just a matter of finding it. Um, but I also know, like you said, Linda, you can create family with the connections you build over a lifetime and the friends that you, I can tell you there's sometimes, I'm sure you all agree that friends become closer than family, right? And and become more, more um, you know, closer to you. So um, that's, it's, it's, if, if anybody has any questions about that, I think that's a, a topic I definitely want to bring up more regularly is just the, um, the choices we make um, for our lives moving forward, because there, you are knowing that this could be passed on to someone else, and how do you wrap your head around that, or or help those those people, or or if you're someone who maybe is here because your children have it, or you have it and your children have it, it's definitely a topic I don't want to be dead in the water here. I know we're talking about love, lust, and and trust. Um, um, but um, I appreciate that you guys talking about your 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 desire to have kids or not have them, and also that I I did an interview with Tori a couple weeks ago, and she's 25, I think, 26, and 
um, you know, it's just amazing to talk to these younger women who know that they have this, or at least are in the process of, of beginning to understand what they have and they're having to make these difficult decisions. Um, it's, it's not easy, so. One other thing that kind of helped was I knew at the time, if we were gonna have kids, that having a child with her condition was not like a normal person having a child. It could right. have put her in a chair years earlier and she ended up there. So it, it's, it's something you have to think about. What's this going to do physically to this person? Yeah. And I didn't want to take a chance on that. Yeah. I, yeah, you, you almost know if you're making that choice, you could, you could be giving up the person that Linda could have become if, if she didn't get that, you know, chance to, to live physically as fully as she could, as long as she could. Um, but you know, I, I have, I have to say, Danielle, that, and I think Monica would agree that our lives have been wonderful with periodic paralysis and that if anything, it has made my life more full um, because of the people I've been able to meet and the work that I've been able to do. So periodic paralysis has always kind of come along as my Okay, yeah, you're there, you know, but it's never defined who I am. And I would never, ever have wanted my parents to make a decision not to have had me um, because I love life. I really do. Yeah, I I know you do. I just in the few months of working with you, I, I feel it. I know this whole this whole board is, you know, passionate about helping everybody who's going through this. And and there is something to be said for the word love just being in your heart and you being able to know that no matter what kind of life you're living it has been a loving full life because of the choices you want to make no matter what you know obstacles are in front of you whether they're physical or mental um you foresee nothing but a great life that you've had because you've had so much love in you. that's exactly it yeah that's awesome. I'm so, it's killing me over here. So I see one of the questions that came in was, where can I find one of these men? <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it is, I mean, it is, it is so true that it is not easy. I mean, finding someone in general is not easy. I mean, I even confess that, you know, I've had two previous marriages and it's not easy. Um, especially when you throw in chronic illness and everything that goes along with it. But um, I don't know. I that's a where do you find one of these men? Like as one of these men, Dan, what advice? <laughs> <laughs> that is not true. No. So, so you know, I think I think what that kind of kind of you know where where are all these men? What I mean. I don't consider myself any different, so to speak, for for being with Monica uh, because she has periodic paralysis. Um, first, I, I've never I've never known Monica without periodic paralysis. So so it's kind of you know this this is this is my Monica. You know this is the way she is, and I, I like to think that. We, we all have some kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say impairment or illness or, but, but something along those lines, we, we all have these, these deficiencies that make us us. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I also like to think there's, there's someone for everyone out there. So, um, yeah, that the fact, the fact that Monica's, illness is 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 you know is what makes her her i mean i i have things that make me me that aren't you know they they aren't nice or or pleasing or uh they're just not readily visible like what monica has right so and i think that would be true for anyone um maybe i'm wrong maybe, <laughs> maybe no, I'm, or, or, 
we all have our strong suits is the word I like to use. It, it, it defines our personality, but maybe at times it's not the best version of us that comes out, but it is a part of who we are. Um, and it, and it, we can't be ourselves without it. Right. So that person who ends up loving us or finding a man like this is about finding someone who you don't just see, but accept those flaws and know you can't, you can't have that person without them. Right. You, 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 you want that whole person. You but don't want also, to. They, they also help. They also help you be the best version of you. Yes. Yes. So there's a, there, I forgot the speaker that says that there's a famous speaker that says without friction, there is no growth. And I truly believe in that. And, and touching on Linda's point about how PP has also given her so much, um, I feel the same way. There are certain things about my character or the, my perception of life now that I would have never grown enough to see without the challenges of um, what PP has given me. And, you know, when it comes to my relationship with Dan, you know, there's even been times when I've questioned, like, why, why would you sign up for this? Like, you know, this isn't easy, you know? I mean, it's, a fin it's financially, um, you know, difficult because of, you know, medical bills and doctor bills and, you know, and medications and, you know, and just all of these things. And then on top of it, your life can just get blown up in, 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 in a moment, you know, you, you may have this whole week planned, um, you know, what you have to do at work and everything. And now it just explodes because, you know, I'm now dependent on you and I need your help. And I mean, the list goes on and on. I know that everybody listening to this doesn't need me to go through that list. They know that list, they live that list. And so I always, in the beginning, it was a lot of questioning of, why? Why would you sign up for this? And that sometimes Dan would have to, um, I, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you, yeah, reassure me, you know, you're so much more than your illness. There's, you know, there's, there's so much more that you bring that, that this illness, yeah, 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 it's a nuisance, it's a pain, and it's an expensive thing, but there's so much more to you than that. And that helped me see that this illness doesn't define me. I'm Monica and I have periodic paralysis. You know, it's not, you know, I have periodic paralysis and I'm Monica. It is, this is who I am. I just happen to have periodic paralysis. Right. So, right. Um, so find a man. But, um, I see. That. <laughs> Yeah, I was no, just I, I just was making a joke that find a man who gets that, right? Who who yeah. sees for yeah. more than just the illness, please. I was wondering if I could open so the mic. And I've got a long list of questions here. Yeah, I think now is the perfect time. I'm looking, I'm I'm just getting to look at some of these questions now. I saw the one Monica answered. Would you like me to start? Do you want to go through them? Do you want to open up the mics and just let people ask? Um, I'm, I'm going to open up the mics and everybody will be able to talk. So when, um, just don't talk over one another. Uh, all the mics are on now. And if you see a little red mic next to your name, you might have to click on it to be able to talk. But let's do a couple of these questions that have come in um, fairly recently. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start at the bottom because we actually, you know, did answer some at the top. But okay. one that's down at the bottom here is how do you keep love alive when episodes happen um, after intimacy most of the time? Ten minutes later, all good, mostly breathing better, able to talk again and move. But it sucks uh, for the mood to worry about it. And I, I can give you one really big hint for how to keep that from happening. And that is that if you have medications that you take on a normal basis, especially potassium, pre-dose with potassium before you actually get into an intimate situation. So build up that potassium in your body um, because the adrenaline rush that you get during having sex 
can trigger an attack. So build up that potassium before you even get into uh, the physical intimacy. She also um, mentioned about um, 10 minutes later, it's all good mostly, but it sucks for the mood to worry about it. So um, I do have another piece of advice for afterwards as well that will help with that too. Um, I, I don't think that you'll have to worry so much about afterwards if you do the medication before. I think that you'll be okay through the episode. Um, and it truly is that adrenaline rush that you get during the, the sexual moment that is creating that momentary, uh, you know, you're, you may not be breathing as well, you, uh, you may not be able to talk or move, and then as your body comes down off of this high, everything starts coming back again because the potassium writes itself in your body automatically. Um, I, I really think that pre-dosing with medication is a big uh, to-do, should be a big thing on your to-do list. Like putting in your diaphragm. <laughs> well, and it's the same, it's kind of like, it, you know, I'm very physically active and, and um, you know, so whatever it is that you do, if, it, if you're hypo, you know, you might want to pre-dose, like before you exercise, a lot of people who are athletic, um, that they, they pre-dose, they make sure their diet, you know, you do all the little checklists, right? So that you can make sure. And then if you're hyper, you know, you do what all your little checklists to, to, to raise those chances of success. But I mean, we can do everything right and it still happens, right? And I think for me and Dan, what we've kind of learned to do is um, and, and that mood afterwards doesn't have to be a negative mood. It can be, you know, him going, wow, look at this, I'm so amazing, and I can't even move a muscle, you know, that kind of thing, you know, making light of it or, or finding the humor or finding something to, you know, you know, and, and, and again, it's, it is very much that sometimes what you need from your spouse or your partner is for them to reassure you because sometimes your fears and what you think that they're thinking isn't at all what's happening. And so sometimes you need them to reassure you that, hey, listen, I, I don't care that this happens afterwards. You know, I understand. I want to be close to you. I want this. And, you know, let's take the precautions and let's, and, and, and that mood hopefully will change to a more positive mood. Um, but yeah, I, I, it, it is, uh, it can be a mood killer, but there are, you know, there are some times where you can find a way to kind of make light of it. And just like we were talking about other situations that happen and then you are yeah. able to laugh about it later. Humor, humor is huge. And, and just communication again, right? Like, can I at least put, the, you know, like that's gotta be a big part of just in the sexual act, there has to be an understanding of trust. There has to be an, uh, an open communication um, to keep that trust. I'm sure that's a big, a big part of making sure you feel safe or you're not in a weird mood afterward as well. It's just keeping that communication going. And, and, and the other thing, every, yeah, every, everybody should also remember that rest after exercise is a bad thing. So, I know that, you know, after having a sexual act, the tendency is to want to just lay back in bed and say, ah, I feel wonderful. Really, you should get up and walk around the bed a few times. Go to the bathroom, get up and move around because that rest after exercise uh, can be a killer. So, so you say, sorry, honey, but I'm going to go out and take a walk around the block. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or you get on the like a little treadmill next to the bed and you just walk a little bit. You, you kind of slowly it's that cool down. You have to cool down. But I think the other part of it though too is, you know, the the sometimes I'm revved up. I'm like, hey, let's go. And he says, no. So so one of the things uh, from like I said in episode, one of one of the uh, crazy symptoms is uh, as she's coming out of it, um, you know, like the you know the next day, or even like maybe even the same day, 
uh, she, 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 she gets, you know, very lustful. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I have to tell her, I'm like, really? I think we should do a timeout here. Uh, this is going to go off real quick. Um, so so I, I actually have to be the one to say, Let, let's wait a little bit. Let, let's 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 get you uh, a little. Let's get you walking. And then you get that. Let's get you to the other way. You can find me. So funny. So funny. My cheeks are. I've been stuck in this laugh the whole night. Uh, one, uh, one of our other questions is how can you reassure your spouse that everything will be okay even after 20 years of episodes? The spouse realizes. But this will never end. Um, I mean, that's that's where I live. I think that's where Monica and Dan live. Uh, you're right. It's it's going to be never ending until a cure is found for periodic paralysis. But it's just really getting your mindset into uh, that life can go on with periodic paralysis. And you know, getting control of your attacks and uh, you know, eating the right foods can get them down to a minimum where you, you can live the best life that you can live. You said it though, mindset. It is mindset. It is a mindset to. It, it doesn't happen like that, right? And I oh. I can't relate in re, in when it comes to a chronic illness, but sports or career or anything that you put your mind to and accomplished you know it takes a certain mindset to want to get to the other side of that and and you know if you if you once you realize it's never going to end there's got to be a different mindset to create that still life that you want to live right and live beyond that that knowing that yeah, no, you, you you can have a happy relationship with periodic paralysis as part of the relationship. Right. And, and it's just that's even in our wedding vows, I mean periodic paralysis is is again, it doesn't define me. It's not that is doesn't make me MAGA, right? It's just part of it, right? It's just part of who I am. And and even in our wedding vows, you know, he mentions it in our, in because we wrote our own vows. He mentions it. I mention it. It's something that it is. It is in the relationship. It's it's something we're gonna have to deal with. Um, but it is all about the mindset. I, I, you, the days that you can do anything, right? Like the days that you can take care of yourself in a sense of being able to brush your own teeth or, or to eat something or laugh with your spouse or to watch a movie and, and cry. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's like, you have to look for the positives. It, and now that doesn't mean that I never have a pity party for myself. After an episode, I usually have a pity party for myself, depending on how long the episode is and how much of our lives exploded. I go through this pity party part Dan is all he's like, okay, baby, this is where you're at. And we allow it for this amount of time. You can have a pity party. I'm going to have a pity party for myself for today. Tomorrow, I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to start thinking about the positive parts that I still have in my life. This past year, I spent a month in the hospital and this had nothing to do with periodic paralysis. It had to do with my gallbladder. They weren't sure if I was ever going to be able to eat food again okay at that time when they were like you may have that tpn backpack where you get nutrition into your artery or whatever for the rest of your life and you never have food because they couldn't even give me a feeding tube because my digestive tract was so messed up that's when i was like i will take periodic paralysis over never being able to digest food ever again turn your head right around you're like that was the periodic paralysis bad but never eating or drinking anything for the rest of my life. Thank God that, that that wasn't the path that my body went down. I was fortunate enough that it didn't go down that way, but it helps put things in perspective. And I yeah. think that that for Linda too, and anyone who, who helps other people, 
when you're helping other people and you see it on a daily basis that their their struggle is more than your struggle then yes it is very easy to be grateful that um you know you're it, it just changes your perspective and i think that's that's mindset definitely mindset it it it's um you made it that experience or that story it makes me think like you almost you that's the only choice you have right like it's either <laughs> it's either stay in my pity party or i know i'm being you know we're being silly about that it's much hard it's much harder than that but you right. know that's really the choice it's much deeper than that right yeah, but that's just what you give it of course mm -hmm. but it's like stay in this space or change and right. the only thing that you, that is in between those two is a mindset like to make that, that action to go positive I mean, that's the yeah right and then and danielle you 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 touched on a very yes it's not that i'm trying to be dismissive or not realize this it is a struggle it is it is not oh i'm having a pity party and la 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 no it is it is depressing day in day out day in day out struggling for any movement struggling for any quality of life struggling to be able to do what you were able to do yesterday or the day before or a week ago or a month ago it's not it's not that it's for me how i view it is i'm going to allow myself to be here and be upset and i'm going to put a time limit on it because i don't want it to take over the rest of my life yeah. And sometimes it's one day, sometimes it's three days, depends on how bad things have gotten. But at some point, I, I have a conversation with myself and I say, okay, I have to choose. Just like you were saying, I have to choose. I can stay in this dark place or I can step into the light and be grateful for whatever it is that I have. Um, and it is, it is hard and by no means are we trying to make light of it or by no means are we trying to Same make thing. say that it's easy because it's not of it's not of course it's of course and you guys are, are proof of that you guys have pushed through the challenges to to build a life together not necessarily in spite of pp but along with it um right. so the the success all great success comes with those struggles so if we're going to look at it, it the people listening in at, at getting these insights from two successful couples or couples who have created happiness and are are moving through life with the challenge of pp that is that is that's key is that you guys are doing it together you're look i was just thinking earlier like here we are we're two hours into this and all of us are still in tune and listening and connected and aware of each other and that's something to be said to be able to sit next to your spouse for two hours and like dive in and talk about these things right um so i i i wanted to find out if there's i don't know if i know you had the mics open linda if you saw that anyone else had any other questions that they wanted to bring up um i i, I think we can just ask if anybody is listening and you want to say something feel free now does, is the time yeah, you does have, anyone have anything they want to say we shall see i will no. as, as um as we're just wrapping up here not taking anyone's time away if you do want to speak up we are here we're all ears but if you do have questions, um, maybe you watch this later and you have questions that come up or um, you start bringing in some of these insights and have new questions after trying them out, always remember we're here for you guys and you can always email us. Um, Linda, personally, um, takes care of so many of the messages that come in. So feel free to um, you know, send us a message, let us know where you're coming from or, or how you've enjoyed this or what you've learned from this and of course any questions that you have we are open and and here for you and uh, we might not have the perfect answer but we are going to support you and, and give you the best answer we can and help point you in the right direction so um, and i, I, I want to remind everybody danielle that there are handouts that are available for this webinar um if you should be able to see them on your screen at home and there's also a couple of videos that uh, that you can download to watch. 
so feel free i'm going to leave the you know the site open for a while for people to download these things and you aren't going to be seeing us but they will be able to still yeah, do this and i will i what i can do too uh linda is um if everyone signed up with their email i can um, make sure that um anybody who was signed up for the thing will get these handouts in an email as well um, so okay. we'll there was a question here um it's it's about actually the the uh um my husband is currently looking for a job and is afraid of looking at places that are colder uh, yeah, than cool. florida is it yeah. safe for me to live live in connecticut or yeah. illinois Oh, that's it. So one of the biggest things with periodic paralysis being a trigger is the cold. Um, is, cold. It, is it possible? Yes. Is it? Is it going to be harder? Yeah. Yes. I mean, even here, even in Florida, I mean, th this morning when I got up early this morning and it was cold outside, my I mine is paramyotonia, so cold is makes my muscles contract, and I it's I mean. It is it documented that cold, not just cold weather, but cold in general is um, makes makes PP much worse. So that might, yeah, you might want to consider that. Other than Florida, you can look at Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, officially last week Texas is out, right? Didn't they just have a snap? No, 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 we don't want to keep Texas. But, but you know, even if you are living in the cold, it's it's a matter of you being smart and keeping yourself warm. You know, if you can stay warm in your house, in your car, there are something. Uh, there's a product called Grabbers, G R A B B E R S, and these are packs that you can actually stick to your clothes um they aren't you know like if you stuck one in the middle of the back of your back on top of your shirt they last for about 12 hours and it's unbelievable how warm they'll keep you they have them for your hands and also for your feet so there are ways to keep yourself warm you just have to kind of do some pre-planning and uh you know maybe maybe not go snow skiing or something like that but uh you know, lim limit your time outdoors in the cold. Uh, I, I, got a, I got an attack skiing. <laughs> That's why when you're like, oh, snow skiing, I was like, oh yeah, I did. But yeah, the cold is a huge trigger. Well, um, I, I appreciate all four of you, both couples for coming on here tonight. This has been awesome getting to hear your stories. If anybody listening in has any uh, questions later on, even just for these two couples, Dan and Monica and, and Linda and Ed, and they want to ask, we we are all a part of the PPA and we're here to help. So just because we're signing off now doesn't mean that we're gone. You can always ask us questions. Email us at lynda.feld at periodicparalysis.com. She'll be getting them. And, um, uh, dot org. Dot org. org. Dot org, Danielle. Dot org. I apologize. Linda.feld at periodicparalysis.org. Um, yeah. And uh, I will make sure you all get an email as well with these handouts in it. And if you guys are, um, you, if you follow us on social media, if you're on Facebook or on Instagram, um, share with us how you've enjoyed this, what you've learned from it. Um, head on over to our page on Facebook or on Instagram. We're at Periodic Paralysis Association. Um, and stay in touch with us. Let us know if you have questions there or if you have any ideas that came up after this. We are going to be hosting our webinars um, more frequently. I know we have one coming up in March. Um, so look out for an email or information about that as well. Linda, do you want to talk a little bit about that webinar or do you want to wait um, and put it in an email oh, to everybody? No, it, it's okay. I think that everybody here should get the first chance to know what it's about and this next one is going to be about acupuncture and we have dr tammy bennett joining us that night and she will be demonstrating her method of uh, treating people with periodic paralysis with acupuncture and how she can help them yeah it's gonna be very cool we're gonna hopefully do a live demonstration as well right we are yes oh. 
That is scheduled for March 11th, correct? Correct. Yep. We have uh, one other. We have one other comment here from someone who has um, three children. They all three have periodic paralysis, as they as I do. Um, my youngest, my daughter, has a milder version. I decided to have kids, even though understanding that it could get get it, they could get it too. I guess I felt that my mom had me knowing that too, and I am glad she had me. This condition is frustrating, but not life ending. It's an obstacle that can be dealt with, but it does take strength and mind and spirit, which is absolutely, absolutely That's very right. It does, and you want to. It, it is definitely a strength of the mind and spirit beautifully said whoever sent that in beautifully said and um, yes what a great way to end it too uh yeah that, that really does represent what 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 we were all here to talk about tonight so thank you thank you linda for letting me join tonight and be a part of this oh, thank, you. thank you danielle you are a big hit <laughs> great way to moderate. You did awesome. <laughs> yes. Good. Good. Thank I'm you glad. very much. You guys all have a good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.